Nanhi was a woman who came to the United States and was a student. Um, she eventually ended up in a relationship with um, someone and had a child with him. And unfortunately, the relationship became abusive. And so in 2009, she had actually been told that her status here in the United States was no longer valid and that she had to return to her home country. And because she was in this relationship that was not a healthy environment for her nor her child, she left, she fled to South Korea where she lived with her daughter. So she left the country and her child's father promptly reported her for child abduction to the authorities. So she was in Korea for about five years with no idea that these charges were waiting for her back in the US. And in 2014, she returned um, and immediately upon returning to the United States, she was seized by Customs and Border Protection. So she immediately lost all custody, was denied all contact with her daughter, and, um, and was held in jail in Yolo County for many months before she ever saw trials. Why are you taking her? Where are you taking her? Can you tell us where she's going? They were aware that she was in an abusive relationship. There was enough evidence to, to point to that. And under the Violence Against Women Act, all survivors of domestic violence are supposed to be informed about their right to self-petition for themselves. And Nanhi was never informed of that. And so the immigration system really ended up failing Nanhi. By the time that we got involved in the case, it was at a point when there just didn't seem to be really any other option. So we were like, okay, so how do we mobilize our networks? So the first meeting that we had for the campaign was actually in my living room. We just were here for hours, you know, four or five hours at a time, just really trying to figure out how we were able to get Nanhi to her freedom, you know? And we didn't really see another option besides community organizing. This isn't a case that big media is gonna pick up on. It's not gonna be that interesting to them unless we make it interesting, and unless we set the narrative. So social media, it just seemed like that was the only tool we had to really get the word out. There was a lot going on in the campaign. We had the actions at ICE, we flooded people's voicemails, and we got thousands and thousands of signatures for the petition. We turned out people to actually attend her trial every day. What was powerful was that it's kind of rare to see a community mobilizing around a domestic violence survivor. This case was really special because a lot of the legal team actually came together after the campaign had gone public. And so a lot of the attorneys who had heard about the case first read about it in a news article. I think one of the main challenges was just that her criminal case, immigration case, and family case were just so intertwined and complicated. And in the organizing team, none of us are legal experts. Like, we're all organizers, and we have kind of a general sense of how things work. I was able to connect a lot of the organizers with some of the legal team folks and explain to them the, the issues that were happening. So her immigration attorneys, Zach and Amalia, told me that she might be allowed out on bond, so we needed to get the money together. And by that point, we had fundraised enough for the bond. So it was very exciting, and it was very emotional. And there was a sense that, like, is this really happening? Is ICE gonna find out and change their minds? After she was released and we had a press conference here in San Francisco, she told me that the letters were a huge source of comfort to her when she was detained, and that she would read them over and over and over again when she was locked up. There were probably hundreds of letters that were written in those sessions to be able to encourage people to be writing these letters uh, no matter where they are and that this is the one thing that they can pitch into the campaign, I think was a really wonderful and beautiful thing. You know, one way I can tell that the campaign was successful is that it creates more space to do more work. We've been developing this project called Survived and Punished at the intersections of immigration, criminalization, race, domestic violence, sexual violence. We really prioritized building solidarity with other people and with other struggles and make the connections that need to be, need to be made with each other and also around the issues as well.